Hey guys, in the last video that I did about Tor, I talked about some of the issues that I feel like the Tor project is introducing for some of their more advanced users, mainly the changes to the HTTP user agent spoofing in the Tor browser, as well as the lack of addressing with the BGP hijacking issue where guard nodes that are vulnerable to BGP hijacking are chosen more often than not in the network's route selection algorithm, which actually has the potential to expose the IP addresses of people using Tor, especially when the BGP hijacking is being done by a nation state in a coordinated way to target all the guard nodes in a specific region. And I didn't really give you guys any ways to mitigate those threats in the last video, which is what I wanna show you today. Now, before we begin, I want you all to remember and know that these modifications that we're gonna be making to a Tor browsing setup are not officially approved by the Tor project, and if these are done incorrectly or for the wrong reason, they can actually harm your OPSEC. So you should definitely do your own research on the things that I'm gonna be showing you today and not just blindly follow what you saw in a video online. So let's begin with the HTTP user agent issue. A quick recap, the Tor browser used to make everyone that was browsing on a PC with JavaScript disabled look like they were a Windows user regardless of what their OS was. And the Tor browser developers decided to remove that Windows OS user agent spoofing so that it would match the real user agent of the machine that was revealed by JavaScript. So now Mac users actually look like Mac users, Linux, BSD, and Cubes OS users all show up as Linux and so on. And this was done because the conflicting user agents would occasionally break those JavaScript enabled sites when someone tried to use them on the Tor browser. So Tor users on Windows really aren't affected by this change. In fact, they might just have a more stable experience on those JavaScript sites when they're using Tor, but Mac and Linux users who are actually a minority on the Tor network are now going to stick out more than they used to. Now in Firefox and browsers based on it, like the official Tor browser, you can hard code an HTTP user agent in about config by adding in the preference general.useragent.override and then select it as a string and paste in a user agent string of a Windows user. So over here in my Windows 11 virtual machine, I can go into a Tor browser and this is my user agent that websites are going to see, which tells them that I'm using Windows and I'm using Firefox version 128, which is the ESR release that the Tor browser is based on. So you should be able to just copy this user agent over here and then paste that into the setting on a Linux setup. But the problem is even after you put this in to the general user agent override, when you go to check your user agent on a site like whatismyuseragent.com, it's still going to read that you're using Linux. And the reason for this is this privacy.resist fingerprinting setting here, which is hard-coded to true. This actually overrides our override. This sets your user agent along with a number of other things. And again, you can see that it's locked to the end user. And I personally haven't found any easy way to get around this, whether you change the custom uh, user JS file or you edit the prefs.js file in the Tor browser. Now I'm sure you could go into the source code of the Tor browser and then change things around and then manually compile that modified Tor browser. But then at that point, you're basically just forking the Tor browser, which is a whole lot of work. So since we're talking about forking the Tor browser at this point, which is a fork of Firefox, we could just use another fork that's less locked down and then modify its settings to be more like the old Tor browser before lock settings like this became a thing. I think LibreWolf is a pretty good candidate because it's a privacy hardened fork of Firefox that already has a lot of the same settings that the Tor browser does. And most importantly, it does not lock that privacy.resist fingerprinting setting that messes up our custom user agent spoofing. 
Now, first and foremost, LibreWolf does not connect to the Tor network by default. So what you're gonna have to do is either run the Tor daemon in a separate process and then connect your proxy settings in LibreWolf to it, or better yet, you can just download LibreWolf onto TailsOS or a Hunix virtual machine, which is what I did here. And both of these route all of the system's traffic through the Tor network by default. Next, we got to get rid of uBlock Origin because as you can see, the LibreWolf browser bundles this with it and websites are able to see what extensions you have installed so they can fingerprint you that way, uh, especially when it's something like an ad blocker. So you've got to remove that and then you also have to install the NoScript extension because this is, uh, I believe, the only extension actually uh, let me go into, yeah, here it is, extensions and themes. Yeah, so NoScript is the only extension that is installed in the Tor browser by default. Um, and it actually handles the um, security slider here. Like the security slider is basically bolted on top of NoScript. It was made to simplify the settings in here. So you can just set it to safest like I have it, which disables uh, all JavaScript, because if you haven't seen uh, no script before, it's kind of a little less user friendly. You know, there's a lot of different things that you can set in here. So more intimidating to new users, which is the reason why the Tor devs wanted to simplify it with this security setting. But the OG Tor users, they know about no script and <laughs> having to deal with uh, blocking scripts and stuff with this manually. Uh, so anyway, you wanna throw that into the LibreWolf browser. And another thing you could do if you really just want to block um, JavaScript, like if you're primarily gonna be using Tor to go to hidden services, then you could just block uh, JavaScript at the browser level with, um, uh, here it is, the JavaScript.enabled set this to false. And so that way you don't have to worry about whether or not you configured no script correctly. And there's a handful of other settings that you're gonna to want to modify in the LibreWolf browser to make it the same as Tor. You know, basically look at the about config settings of each and try to make it uh, as similar as possible. Another one that you're also gonna to need to change in order to reach uh, .onion domains is you're gonna to have to change this network DNS block .onion to false so that you can actually connect to Onion sites. Now, when you've configured everything in LibreWolf, I suggest you navigate to deviceinfo.me uh, or also what is my user agent, but I feel like device info is better because it actually gives you really, really detailed uh, information about your device. Um, but yeah, this is going to give you things like the headers. So that's one of the main things to check because it's the main, um, it's, it's the main, fingerprint that's gonna be used to track you when JavaScript is disabled. Like if I scroll through, you can see a lot of the hardware and things like that are unknown. So JavaScript blocking really does the heavy lifting when it comes to uh, making yourself blend in on the Tor browser or even on the clear web, you know, anywhere on the internet. If everybody looks the same or you have fewer parameters to go off of, uh, then it just makes you blend in better. So we can go to our user agents here. And so you can see that everything is pretty much the same in our request headers. The only difference is that over here in LibreWolf, I'm telling people that I'm using Windows. So I actually look more like a Tor user on Windows rather than a Tor user on Linux or Hunix in this case, which is what um, my user agent here in the Tor browser is reporting. Now, before you go browsing Tor with this setup and thinking you're so hacking anonymous, it's also worth looking at Mozilla's documentation for the resist fingerprinting setting in Firefox and its derivatives so that you can understand the trade-off with disabling the setting because there's a lot more to it than just spoofing your user agent. Now, a lot of the device fingerprinting that this is mitigating here is gonna overlap with disabling JavaScript. So as long as we keep that disabled, then we're pretty much good, but there is something very big that you lose with resist fingerprinting, and that is the spoofed screen resolution. 
So if we go back to our Hunix VM, we can see that the Tor browser, and this is true for, I believe, every browser when it has resist fingerprinting enabled, it's gonna tell websites that the screen resolution is 1800 by 900 pixels. But when fingerprinting is disabled, like over here in LibreWolf, your screen resolution is going to be reported as whatever you have it at when the page is full screen. So whenever the page is maximized, this is what it's gonna tell websites your resolution is. And screen resolutions can vary widely. I mean, there's people who have widescreen monitors, there's different aspect ratios, uh, 4K monitors, and so on. And so you could argue that this is actually a much worse fingerprinting vector especially if you aren't using something really common like 1920 by 1080p. Now, you, what you could do, one way you could maybe mitigate this is press Control plus Shift plus M to toggle the responsive design mode in Firefox or LibreWolf. So this is kind of a developer setting that you're normally supposed to use when developing a website and you know spoof different user agents and screen resolutions to make sure that your website doesn't look funky on certain resolutions. Um, and yeah, you can see that here in deviceinfo.me, it updates the resolution to 1800 by 900. So it seems like it's fingerprinting it correctly, you know, or it seems like this spoofing uh, actually is working, but the thing is it's really inconvenient, right? If I go to the next tab, I'm not spoofing it on this page, so I'd have to do it again, you know, control shift M. And um, yeah, that can just get really inconvenient. A lot of people are probably going to forget to do that before they open a new tab. Uh, or actually, I wonder if it persists across different websites. Let me check that real quick. Okay, yeah, it looks like it does. So, you know, I guess as long as you stay within this tab or you remember to do that uh, automatically when you open a new tab, you might also be able to create some kind of automation in the browser to do that for you. Uh, but you get the picture, right? There's a lot more extra work that you have to do here to keep that fingerprint consistent. And also, I'm not even entirely sure whether or not websites can tell that you're in this responsive design mode or you know whether you're just spoofing your resolution another way. So in the end, this might actually just make you stick out even more when you're browsing. And the same kind of trade-offs exist with some of the mitigations to the BGP hijacking threat. So the most straightforward solution to that that I can think of would be to connect to a proxy, a VPN, or possibly even a public Wi-Fi. That might be the best case scenario before you connect out to the Tor network. And the reason for that is if a BGP hijacking attack happens on the guard node that you're using, then all the attacker is gonna get is the IP address of that proxy or that VPN or that public Wi-Fi network. But again, just like these browser modifications, if we make an extra hop, which would be a proxy or a VPN provider, that's also gonna make your traffic stand out more to a few different people. So anyone who's running a guard node or who is observing the traffic of guard nodes is going to notice a VPN IP address connecting to that guard node. That's gonna stand out. And anyone who's observing the VPN server's traffic coming out of the server, they're gonna see connections going from that VPN to a Tor network, which again, also stands out because most people who are using VPNs are not connecting to Tor and vice versa. Most people using Tor are not using VPNs before their connection. And if your threat model is trying to protect your data or protect from getting tracked from a global adversary that can observe traffic both going in and out of the Tor network on a global scale along with spinning up malicious nodes themselves, it would be pretty trivial for them to observe the traffic going in and out of a VPN provider which would render that extra VPN hop that you're doing for privacy useless. Now a better, albeit much more tedious way to figure out whether or not you're gonna be safe from BGP hijacking for a Tor session is to actually validate the BGP security of the hops 
in your Tor circuit, specifically in the guard node, if you're worried about your IP address being revealed. So we can look up information about the ASN and the uh, BGP prefix or BGP implementation of these IPs using either this whois command where we specify whois.cymru.com as the host and then we put in the IP address of that hop in our Tor circuit and we can see that this belongs to autonomous system 680 and that is Deutschen Foreign Steisen. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that horribly, uh, but you get it. It's some kind of German ISP. Uh, so what we can do now is go over to, is BGP safe yet? This is a service that I believe Cloudflare offers. Yeah, we can see their little logo up there. Um, and you can also test the BGP implementation of your ISP or the VPN that I'm using in this case. And you can see that <laughs> <laughs> they are not implementing BGP safely. They're part of uh, CDN 7.7. I believe this is Proton VPN um, that I was testing out. So yeah, you obviously got to make sure that you're using a better VPN than that uh, if you're trying to use the VPN to mitigate the BGP issue because they might not even be doing it as good as the Tor Guard node is. Um, but anyway... Let's go down here and we want to show all of these operators. So this is gonna show all of the autonomous systems and we also wanna show the ASN column to make it easier to find. And we're gonna look for 680. And here we go, the DFN, that's what they're called. So we can see that their implementation, I mean, I guess it's just as good or just as bad as um, Cloud flares may be potentially worse since this is actually, I think cloud, this is a um, uh, like a hosting service. For, well, this is actually an ISP and we see it's partially signed and they do some filtering on it. Um, but anyway, you might not want this for your threat model, right? You want, you might want something that is fully signed and is doing filtering. Uh, so let's say that I'm not comfortable with this hop. I can just request a new Tor circuit for this site. And so now it's giving me an American one. So we'll go ahead and write down this IP 108.211.32.201. And then if we come back over to my terminal, post paste in that command with the new user. And this is, looks like AT&T. So they're probably implementing BGP in a fairly secure way. Let's double check on, is BGP safe yet? Uh, let's see, is this an alphabetical order? No. All right, we'll just look up AT&T. And yes, sure enough, they're signed and filtering. So at least according to this site, is BGP safe yet? According to Cloudflare, uh, AT&T does implement BGP in a safe way. So now this is where you kind of have to figure out for your threat model, is it better to use a German guard node that is not implementing BGP in a super safe way, or is it better to use an American guard node that is implementing BGP safer? It's gonna depend, right? It's gonna depend from person to person and threat model to threat model. So there are some potential mitigations to the issues that people have been talking about in the Tor browser and the Tor network. Unfortunately, there aren't any simple fixes without some kind of trade-off, but hopefully for some of you out there, these solutions can actually be useful for your threat model. I could even see someone automating the process of selecting hardened guard nodes to defend against the BGP hijacking attack, you know, basically a shell script that automates that process we just manually went through with validating the security of those guard nodes. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and share it to hack the algorithm. Check out my online store, base.win, where you can buy my awesome merch, like this Come and Find a t-shirt or accessories for your phone or laptop. 10% store-wide discount when you pay with Monero XMR at checkout. Have a great rest of your day.